Um, so uh, I'll focus on the interpretation of the seismic. Uh, we'll come back to Dom later to give you a bit of overview on some of the geochronology work and implications from that. And Janelle will look at the MT data. Um, so we're looking at Mount Isa. You can see the outline of the outcrop there in gray and uh, Georgetown area over here to the east. So we focused on these nine seismic lines highlighted in blue, integrated with the MT especially, but also oak crop geology potential field a bit with the tomography data. So I'll start by uh, showing you uh, a bit about uh, our approach to the interpretation, then focus in on the basement terrains, really looking at those uh, fundamental crustal blocks at depth and uh, we'll um, jump back and forth a bit, um, talk about some of the insights and implications, but um, we'll really pull that together after Janelle has uh, shown you the MT data. So it's important to think about what is basement and what we're referring to when we talk about basement. I've uh, taken this image on the left from the Northern Territory um, and then added in Queensland here. So this is a nice summary because it highlights here by about 1800, 1790. Um, the units above that are largely um, are less deformed and less metamorphosed um, throughout much of the area. And it's the, the units before we've got this package of 1880 to 1790, uh, largely supercostal rocks that have been deformed and metamorphosed. So we only see the rare hints of the older Archean um, or any older rocks in there. So then we've got our cover sequences um, across Mount Isa, and I'm just flagging here the Etheridge group, um, which we'll see in the seismic lines is uh, equivalent, uh, very similar in age to the soldier's cap, Curridala groups. Then we have deformation, isonerogeny, collision with Laurentia and those younger basins. So when we were thinking about what's exposed as basement in the Mount Isa area. It's dominantly the Chalcedon Leichhardt belt um, here, which looks relatively insignificant, but obviously exposed over a large area. And then we've got Uringa and a few other uh, Kirbyaya, um, older uh, gneisses and rocks. Um, so we're really focused on those older deformed and metamorphosed rocks, but recognizing that in the Eastern Fold Belt and, and Georgetown, uh, some of these younger units are deformed and metamorphosed, but uh, we're still keeping those in the cover sequence. And we're really trying to nut out those deeper fundamental basement blocks. They're discrete, mappable, structurally bounded blocks of crust. Now, just briefly, North Australian Craton, you can see outlined here in yellow, um, which I, I like to show up, throw up this image because it really shows just how vast this, uh, this block of crust is. It has um, some other uh, fairly competent blocks like Kimberley, Pine Creek, um, Arnhem, and then some less well-defined terrains. So most of the outcrop, as we've said, 1880 to 1790, um, but we have the evidence that Dom will talk about um, from uh, the model ages that there's a lot of late Archean, early Proterozoic crust through this area, very consistent ages across much of the NAC until we get to the Eastern Fold Belt, uh, Numel and to the East, and we see a, uh, a change that Dom will talk about. So there's a core that probably formed early on, certainly by 2200, if not earlier, and then final assembly uh, involves Kimberley, Aileron, and Numel all coming in sometime during this period. Now, we're focused here in this study um, on the Mount Isa region. So we're looking at the edge of these east-west trending basement terrains and trying to un better understand what lies beneath all those um, cover sequences in Mount Isa. So, in terms of previous work, we've got in yellow, you can see the boundaries here are the <clears throat> domains. So they're focused on this largely on the cover sequences, um, but also including the, the Chalcedon Leichhardt belt. In orange, there's about five lines through here. So that'd be the cork fault, Gija suture, another north south boundary through here that wasn't named. And this one, so these are the major boundaries from Corsh and Dublier. And then in red on this other image are the basement terrain boundaries from 
frog tech uh, and geognostics. And so I, I worked with frog tech for years, was involved in a lot of this interpretation. But we can see through this Mount Isa area, because the projects hadn't focused on pulling apart the seismic in the way we've now done, um, at that time we had to rely on those, uh, a, a lot on those domains. So our results show some broad similarities, but really highlight a new understanding in the terrains, the major structures, fluid pathways, and controls on those cover sequences. Um, so briefly on the approach, um, and so it, the, the project really was focused on the basement terrains, but in order to be able to do that interpretation, we still had to uh, look at the near surface section. So I started out, you know, you can see these unit names. I went through and just marked off any outcropping units. Uh, this is uh, the old 94 line, so going through just south of Mount Isa. And uh, I've got metamorphic grade there, looking at the domains and these red, green, blue lines are gravity highs, gravity lows, just trying to integrate all that information. So, you know, I'd look at uh, changes in style, variations in the reflections, and then just highlight the main trends you can see in pink and where are the breaks, you know, truncations and reflections or subtle low angle uh, truncations the same way you know anybody would do with gravity and mag data. So I'd start by interpreting the most obvious features and then compare to the other lines and, and sort of a long strike with the gravity and mag data. Um, but I and this is something I feel very strongly about whether you're working in cross-section or plan view you really need to go to that next step and fill in your interpretation using all the constraints Otherwise, you don't really understand, or you will find um, features you hadn't really considered when you try and, and, and make that full color image. Um, so this is an example. This is the M6 line with the location highlighted here in white. Now, I really do want to emphasize from the start that these nice colored images you're seeing as the final product um, aren't based solely on that one line. So it's integrated from all nine lines, from the MT data, all the other data we were using. So that in some cases, you know, a, a given basement train might not be well defined on a seismic line, but by building that regional understanding, we can make that interpretation. So in all the lines, uh, you can see these red lines, hopefully. Um, so they're every five seconds. So that's the full 20 second image. Um, so it's roughly equivalent to 60 kilometers. So the, you can think of those red lines as being that first one's gonna be at about 15 kilometers or a bit less. Um, most of the images, hopefully I've got in here at uh, roughly uh, vertical equals horizontal resolution. So you'll always see that 20 kilometer scale bar um, and, or, or close to that. So you're largely seeing true dips. Okay, oh, briefly on the legends. So we've defined two new basement terrains, the Central Isa and Pitta Pitta, um, the Numal Abingdon and Eggwoman or Thompson Origin were, were largely defined by uh, Korsh and others at GA on the 07 series of um, seismic lines. Uh, Tenant obviously linking through to Tenant Creek in the West, Ultrawara, um, uh, is the southern one sort of the May Downs area. There's a few different names for that area. Um, <clears throat> we'll refer to it as Ultrawara. This package in yellow that you'll see uh, mainly in the west, so that's that package of 1880 to 1790 sort of supracustal rocks, so where I can see what looks to be a more layered package above the, the basement I've highlighted. And I will take a moment on this next slide to explain this unit you'll see in the in the dark purple or maroon, uh, which is a, a, a mixed unit. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, some of you may have seen my presentation at the conference back in February. So I decided to try and restore um, the, the M6, M5 section. So this is the Soldiers Cap Curry Dollar Group Basin. I'm happy to come back to this later, but mainly what I want to emphasize right now is that we have several lines of evidence that suggest the crust was highly thinned. Um, 
during development deposition of this basin system. And this is just one bit of data from Griffin and others, where you can see the ju increasing juvenile input that peaks during deposition of soldiers camp in Curry Dollar groups. <clears throat> and so that mixed unit I see as this thinned edge of uh, this, the um, basement trains beneath the Mount Isa cross. So central Isa, the overlying Leichhardt super basin are probably the main units mixed in there, but we might have some serpentinized mantle or even oceanic crust or bits of the sedimentary sequence, but it's gonna be dominated by uh, those units. So we can see that now here on the CF3 line here in the south. So that's that unit in the dark purple. Um, I found I couldn't, you know, consistently try and break out the Leichhardt Super Basin, Central Isa, and based on my understanding of the basin development, the basin evolution, um, I decided to uh, have that mixed package. So here we'll start with the Pitta Pitta basement terrain and CF3, I've started in the south because that's a line it's best, best defined on. Uh, and Janelle <clears throat> flagged this one uh, from, from work she and Dom were doing a couple of years ago. Uh, pardon me, <clears throat> I'm obviously getting a bit croaky. <clears throat> it's uh, a, you know, a, a trapezoidal looking block and is a long gate north south. We can trace it through uh, to the north on the other seismic lines doesn't reach surface, it seems to be somewhere around five seconds, maybe up to four seconds. Generally higher density in the gravity models. Um, uh, we don't tend to see strong reflect packages of seismic reflections within it. Uh, and you can see here, we've got strong west dipping reflections here within Ultrawara, uh, marking nicely the boundary there and truncation of reflections. And there's quite a well-developed structure that we refer to as the Urundangi Burktown fault zone that forms the boundary between Pitta Pitta and the overlying central Isa. And I'll, I'll uh, fill you in a bit more on that through, uh, through a couple of slides here. Uh, so the central Isa terrain you can see is uh, it's a elongate tabular sort of block uh, dips to the east, it's eight to 10 seconds thick in two-way time, so 24 to 30 kilometers. Uh, overlies Pitta Pitta, it could represent, it could be part of the same terrain that was just more deformed. It, um, it could be a distinct terrain with a similar history. So what we know from the neodymium data uh, from the model ages is that these two blocks um, show similar ages. Uh, in oak crop, the Chalcodon sweet granites and volcanics obviously are quite voluminous and form that big north-south belt. We see ev rare evidence of the older gneisses. So um, we have the Chalcodon belt intruding central Isa and Pitta Pitta. Uh, so now um, looking at the M6 seismic line here, so it runs through just at the southern edge of oak crop. Um, so Pitta Pitta, the base of it is not well defined on this line, certainly in comparison to CF3, but this boundary with central eyes is quite well defined here. Um, and if you've looked at any of the previous interpretations of the M6 seismic line, you'll see here in the uh, sort of thereby, this is the tail end of the Sabella batholith, you'll always see these east dipping structures uh, opposed, and then opposed to west dipping structures sort of coming together and meeting here. So this model now of the, the basement terrains, the basement blocks explains that, uh, that opposing geometry you see in the faults. And, and that is uh, very well demonstrated on the other seismic lines further north. So here, so this is the 94 line. So we're just south of Mount Isa. And um, I'd suggest that uh, Urundangi Burkdown fault zone links through and probably in or around the Maydowns fault. And you can see the structures come, to, come at uh, so that sort of six, seven seconds, they really flatten and we've got some big scale detachments in the crust. Interestingly, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time debating whether Pitta Pitta um, could extend up here to these 
uh, relatively flat structures in the mid crust, but based on um, all the seismic lines together uh, and correlating through to CF1 further north, um, it makes more sense that the boundary is still dip, east dipping and centralized is a bit thicker here. And I'll come back to that later. So we're jumping north, actually, sorry, I'll just go back. So we're now gonna jump north to the short M3 line um, up in here. So I, haven't, I forgot to put a map on this one. So the first thing you see when uh, on this, this line is the strong east dipping reflections. And it, and it, you know, when you look at the, the blank seismic, it, it, you can really see that thrust package. So that correlates with central ISA. You could push that boundary up or down a little bit, but you'd still have that same geometry. Um, Pitta Pitta might, you know, it could swing a bit further east. We may not have it here, but there is a change in the seismic that uh, we looked at and decided, well, it's, it's reasonable. Pitta Pitta might, uh, uh, might sneak into the end of this seismic line. This is the only one where we really see the tenant terrain, and you can see the West dipping reflections are quite well developed. They're discontinuous, but well developed there in Tenet, whereas all the reflections here in Altuara dip to the east. So that fault is quite well defined um, in here. Now, I will come back to talk about these terrains and um, I'm gonna jump over to Numel. On Mount Gordon fault zone would, uh, would sit in about here, dipping steeply east and would probably link to um, one of these uh, more moderately dipping or listric structures at depth. Okay, coming over to the numel. And so this is our interpretation of the 07 IG1 line. So very similar to the published and interpretation of course and others um, if you zoom in and look at detail in detail you know some di differences along the faults and things but what we've really highlighted is this breakdown of three distinct um, subterrains to the numal so in the west we have this block which seems to be largely unfaulted the central zone dominated by these east dipping fault blocks and the eastern zone dominated by the west dipping fault zones and then Abingdon uh, sitting there to the east. Um, the Gidges structure, so um, I'll make note that we're, we're referring to it as a structure rather than a suture because we think it's got a complex history. It, it probably did reflect original collision between Numelin and uh, the Mount Isa basement terrains but it then was reactivated uh, as a, in an extensional sense. And what we see present day reflects the geometry due to the eyes and erogeny. Um, so it's really well defined in the upper 10 seconds, very strong reflections coincides with the MT data that uh, Janelle will show you a little bit harder in at depth in that lower section to say exactly where it is. And there's probably a few different uh, spots you can put it. So Numel had been well-defined on that 07 line here. So that's the one up in the north. Um, so now we're looking at M6 uh, joined up with M5 here. And Numel hadn't been um, really defined on these, uh, this 06 series of lines. Um, we can see there's a really nice, especially on M5, a strong west dipping fabric that you can see continues through to M6. And that west dipping fabric goes a long ways west beneath the Mount Isa across almost to about the Pilgrim Fault um, zone. And you see that, uh, that same persistence to the west on the CF3 line. So the crust is subdivided into a series of west dipping fault blocks. And the Gidja suture looks like it's folded here. Um, and that's really well defined on the CF line, uh, CF3 line to the south. It's, um, it's quite well constrained. Now we'll look at the next slide shows the CF3 line here and, uh, and the M6 line. So there's the two of them together. And I think that that geometry is remarkably similar. Um, we've got very good constraints on the location of the, the Gidja structure here at depth. So that's between 10 and 15 seconds. Um, those west dipping reflections are quite uh, continuous and trunc truncate east dipping reflections. 
And here in the upper crust, um, you know, above six, seven seconds, you, again, you can see east dipping reflections in the in the soldier's cap group, uh, truncated by west dipping structures. Um, and you can see this wedge-shaped geometry to the eastern margin of both the Pitta Pitta and Central Isa. Okay, the M4 seismic line, if anybody's ever, ever looked at that data, it really is quite variable. There's a large zone in the middle of it here where it's not very easy to interpret. But because it intersects M5, and we and you can see there's quite good reflections here, so there's high confidence interpreting the pneumal here. There's a lower section of the pneumal that's, that doesn't have the same level of reflections, but you have those same west dipping reflections and fault blocks. Uh, and the pneumal there. The Gidja suture is not well defined. If you look at the seismic line, you will not you will not see that as a well-defined structure. But because you can see we're just around the corner from the IG1 line, so we have to, the, the structure has to correlate. It has to be there in a relatively similar position. Um, and so we're showing it a, a similar dip here in the in the lower crust doesn't come straight through um, at, at a similar dip to surface the way it does on the 07 line. We have uh, lots of oak crop geology, you know, through up to uh, about this area. So we know it doesn't come to surface. So it must flatten in the med crust. And that means it it's gonna come to surface somewhere either side of the Kevin Downs anticline uh, uh, granite, um, which would just be sitting uh, over in here at the end of the N4 line, just near the orange line that um, uh, shown from the Corsh and, and Dublier boundaries. Um, it could be coming up here at the Lavuca trend um, or further east in the Brina area. I, I lean towards pointing it a bit further east and see Lavuca is potentially linking through to a splay, but this, this area in here, you see structures dipping in either direction. Um, and it's unclear which one's truncating which. Uh, the Quamby Fault clearly dips steeply east on this line. It's hard to have it as a steep west dip. And th the overhang structure is projected to continue along into this area. And we have this steep east, uh, northeast trending structure that a lot of uh, geologists have talked about and, and James Austin talked about uh, in, in his work through the area. Um, now, the, the mapping shows an irregular boundary between units, which suggests it may be a folded that the, you know, a, a low angle structure has been folded and steepened through there. But I think there's also, it, gut feeling says there's also some steep structures um, having a roll through there. I haven't got a, a good solid answer for this one yet, but it's an interesting area that we, um, I think, uh, deserve some further consideration. And perhaps some additional data might help. Now, uh, overview on the Gidja suture, sort of north versus south. In the north, we have that 45 degree west dip in the south, much more gentle, 20 to 30 degree uh, west dip in the south. And it's steeper in the north where we have the competent uh, pneumal west block present. So that uh, that's probably the main factor there where we have this competent block, we've ended up with a steeper suture zone and thickening, as you can see here, especially on the 94 line and thickening in centralized uh, uh, basement terrain at that eastern margin. So the other thing I wanna highlight here is that the Gidja structure truncates the, the, the Pitta Pitta and centralizer terrains at mid to lower crustal levels. So when you think about the boundary between the terrains, they're at you know, 25 to 35 kilometers depth and they're well to the west of the surface position because the, the surface position position is going to project through well to the east. So those are my arrows I've got here. So in pink, this would be dashed through the Gidja structure near surface, but the location where your terrain boundaries at depth are actually uh, juxtaposed are shown in black here. So on these maps, summary maps that um, you see of our terrain boundaries, so the ones in black are at a mid to lower crustal level 
the ones in red come through to surface or close to surface. Abingdon, um, so mainly defined here in the uh, from the 07 surveys here on the uh, end of the IG1 line and the other uh, seismic lines. And uh, we've interpreted it to come through to the east end of CF1 and CF3. So CF3 here on the bottom, this block is really quite distinct. Um, it lacks reflections. Um, and is uh, has a lower density. So despite the fact that we've all, we've got a quite a large granite in the upper section, we still need a low density body in the lower crust to to match the gravity response through this area. Um, and we can uh, map out a similar block on the uh, on the CF1 line as well. So I will just point out while well, I've got the CF1 line here because I don't show it a lot. Um, the Urundangi Burktown fault zone, which forms the, the boundary between Central Eyes and Pitta Pitta, is quite well defined on this um, on this seismic line. This uh, east dipping structure uh, shows up quite nicely and links through to structures on the margin of, I can never remember, Landsborough maybe, or uh, one of the other younger features there. Gija suture uh, is not well defined on this seismic line, and you've got to work hard to, to map out something that makes sense and in, in relative to the other seismic line. So I've ended up with a Gija suture that is truncated by reactivation of an east dipping structure here on the, the upper margin of the Numal West. Uh, I'll just quickly show you uh, this southern CF2 line, um, which is the one you can see here. So it goes very obliquely through Pitta Pitta and the Altawara basement terrain. So you can see they look elongate and the structures are a bit more uh, shallowly dipping. Then we've got the cork fault here. Um, oh, sorry, there we go. I'll just put the other um, CF3 on top so you can see I've got them lined up there. That's where the two lines intersect. And so that's what they look like east, west, and then north, south. So the cork fault forming the boundary uh, between the uh, uh, rocks, the Mount Isa region, and the Diamantina Thompson origin to the south. Um, so you can see that's very well defined here, dips west, but it's truncated at depth um, by this uh, north dipping fault. Now, the gravity models for these two lines, as I said earlier, Pitta Pitta in general seems higher density, but as we come uh, than the adjacent terrains on the northern lines. But as we come south, you can see Central Isa and uh, Altawara getting a bit higher, uh, higher in density as well. We, we made, uh, Dom and Janelle made a big effort to uh, use consistent densities on all the lines, but we couldn't, you know, we couldn't keep to that everywhere. And you can see this western boundary, the Altawara coming into the Cork Fault is uh, is lower density. So there's uh, probably a lot of deformation and alteration along that boundary. So coming back to Altawara and Tenet uh, in the north. So the M3 line that we looked at is here. And although these Western, uh, the South Nicholson um, and Camel Wheel surveys weren't part of this study, we will start looking at those as a follow-up. Um, I had a quick look at a couple of them just to get more confidence in that tenant Altawara boundary. So SN2 comes down to here, very close to the M3 line, but this line I'm showing you links into this SN2 and C2. Um, which comes down and crosses the boundary, um, the potential surface location uh, of the Altawara and Tenet. So this Carrara fault is very well defined on SN2 and SN1. Um, and the, uh, the uh, Minjara fault, uh, based, named after the, the river creek in the area, dips to the north so that Tenet ends up being a bivergent block overlying Murphy and Altawara. Now, coming back to that M3 seismic line, we can see it here. And so the boundary gently west dipping on this line. So overall dipping to, uh, to the northwest. 
So in Oak Crop, what we see at Tennant Creek is dominantly the 1860 to 1790 supercrustals and granites. We know we had extension 1820, 1800, potentially earlier during deposition of some of those earlier sequences. We have a lot of volcanics in there. Then they're deformed at 1850 and 1790-ish. So this yellow package that I've been mapping with the, the 1880 to 1790 uh, metasediments, metavolcanics, is broadly equivalent to, to tenant. So, so some of that package comes across and is deposited on top of Altuar and, and, and Central Isa. But it's interesting, actually, if I just flick back to consider, so how much of this tenant terrain is that package of supercustals and how much is an older basement? Or is it all, uh, is it a very thick, very large extensional basin formed at that time? So something to consider as we gather some more uh, data around that area. Now, just into the summary and wrap up on understanding the basement terrain. So this is a stack of the uh, Western seismic lines here from CF3, M6, the 94 line and M3. So we can see Pitta Pitta coming through here. It's west dipping boundary with Altawara and east dipping boundary with Central Isa. This um, Urundangi Burktown fault zone, we can see is much better developed. The central centralizes thrust further west over Altawara as we as we come to the north. Uh, just a 3D image um, of the seismic line, so you can see Pitta Pitta trending here through to the north onto M3, and here it is at the north end of CF3. So that's I um, I have more confidence in the Pitta Pitta extending onto CF1, then, then making it onto CF3 um, seismic lines. So it certainly comes through and then is swinging a bit more to the north, northeast on this line, which is what we see actually in the trend of that Calcadun Leichhardt belt. Uh, so the eastern ones, Numal, we talked about the west, central, and, and east terrains. And it's interesting when I look, when you look at the, the southern lines, so this is um, CF3 here in the south, um, Numal uh, is dominated by west dipping fault blocks and is juxtaposed with Abington. And on that basis, it's interesting to consider that this Numal is equivalent to this Numal East um, when we go up to the 07 line. And as we come up to M6 and M5, we see that similar geometry that's probably dominantly um, the Numal East block. You can see M, uh, the M5 line swings to the Northeast, so it doesn't come across to intersect Abingdon. And then when we look at M4, you can see uh, we're close enough to uh, the 07 line, we have to have Numal West in there. It's pretty hard to get away without having Numal West in there. Um, but the upper Numal that we see, again, we've got the strong West dipping reflections and West dipping fault blocks. So it looks like, and we intersect M5. So we correlate this bit of Numal with Numal East, and then we've got Numal West, and the central Numal terrain probably doesn't come far enough so that it's only here on the CF1 and, and uh, 07 lines and doesn't make it down to these other seismic lines. So we're starting to see, uh, put together uh, a better picture of numal and continuity of uh, some of those blocks and structures. Um, so this uh, 3D view, so here's our point of view, we're looking to the south. So this seismic line, uh, I haven't interpreted, I've just brought in the interpretation from the Korshat Al paper and colored in Abington. So you can see it there with the east dipping boundary with Numal and correlating through to the south here. So quick conclusions before we come back and, and look at uh, some more of the implications later after the MT data. So um, five main basement blocks when you're really focused in around this Mount Isa area. So Ultrawar and Tenant to the west, then Central Isa and Pitta Pitta uh, underlying this core zone of the Mount Isa province and then Numal to the east. 
and, uh, and a much better handle on some of these large, especially crustal scale structures. In terms of assembly, so Tenet and Ultra are assembled with the Murphy terrains and the rest of the NAC um, early on prior to uh, accretion of this uh, competent pitta pitta block and it's overlying with or without central ISA. So as I highlighted earlier, they may be part of a related terrain or it could be a separate terrain. Then central ISA is transported west over top of pitta pitta and Ulchawara. So that's that boundary, this UBF said, the urine Urindanji Burktown Fault Zone. So that's the structure that carries um, central eyes of further west. And that has to occur prior to emplacement of the Calcadoon Suite Continental Arc. And somewhere along in there, we have extension in the <coughs> tenant terrain that may be occur before, during, and or after that period. So collision of Numal, there's been debate on the timing and then, you know, there is evidence for, for a younger event um, somewhere in there, but we need to be able to explain the, the shutting off of this continental arc. So it makes sense that Numal with or without Abington collided at around uh, 1850 in order to explain uh, the end of the, the continental arc as plagued by other authors. So in terms of the cover sequences, um, I hadn't really highlighted as we we're going through, but this Urindanji Burktown fault zone, I think really controls the location of the Leichhardt super basin in the West. So the, the Leichhardt river fault trough, um, you know, either it itself or a splay from that structure. Um, and as well as we come to the south, I think that narrowing belt um, as we come down here to the south is controlled by that structure. In the east, um, we have a much thicker, more continuous Leichhardt um, uh, sequence that's controlled or localized over that uh, Gigi structure. And it's that same Gigi structure that played a key role in localizing the, the development of the Col Soldiers Cap Group, Curry Dalla Group Basin. Um, so there are whole lot of factors and we'll come back at the end to pull it together a bit more but the crustal architecture is fundamental to understanding the evolution of the area the cover sequences major structures fluid conduits um, and then the mineralization itself 